Okay, so first of all, I'm hoping to uh, finally get clear about the thing about universal terms and the definitions, which is confusing. I think it's confused me in past years too, but. Um, okay, so the first thing is that according to Popper, well, let's see, uh, it's already it's confusion. The terms, let me put it this way, the terms we use in stating scientific theories should be used in a strictly universal sense, not a numerical universal sense. So, as I think I mentioned before, in German, it actually, it actually says specifically universal. Close to numerically. This is so, I mean, this is actually, this is Aristotelian terminology in the original, like specific identity or specific difference versus numerical identity or numerical difference. Um, however, I'm not sure if that has anything if that really helps to understand what he's talking about. So in any case, they didn't preserve the translation. They translated the script to universal. So, um, so um, the difference is supposed to be like the difference between. So this is part of what's confusing that. The difference between different terms, which is a different way to use terms, but like different terms anyway suggest these different kinds of universality. Like the difference between the term or you know term or concept. Again, term and concept are really the same thing. You know, the two terms of a traditional Aristotelian proposition are the subject con concept and the predicate concept. So the two terms are the two concepts, or the two the words for the two concepts. Yeah. Anyway, so like the term or concept electron versus the term or concept inhabitants of Paris from the Popper's examples or thing on my desk. That was one of Goodman's examples. Um, so, um, like in stating a scientific theory, we should be talking about something that could be a concept that could be realized at any spatiotemporal location. I mean, when I say it could be, that is, we intend it. We intend it as potentially realized in any spatial temporal spatiotemporal location. Um, so uh, as opposed to inhabitant of Paris, which um, can't be unless you're pretty spatiotemporally close to Paris. Right? I mean, I guess you don't have to be in Paris. But you can't be anywhere in the universe because you wouldn't have time to get there from Paris where you supposedly live in <laughs> heaven in Paris, right? So, I mean, you have to be like, this is definitely limited to a, a certain spatiotemporal region. And, um, and it's limited to a spatiotemporal region. At least it looks like because it refers to uh, uses a proper name, which is a name of a thing that is that exists only in certain places and times, and not in all the others. So you know, and similarly for the thing on my desk. So you know, um, Goodman, of course, will say, well, but you know, you can't tell syntactically just by looking at the way it's written. 
what the you know what's the difference between these two, right? That was the GRU example was probably supposed to prove that. Because since you can define GRU and green in terms of green and blue, but you can also define green and blue in terms of GRU and green. And depending on which way you go, it'll depend which ones refer to a specific time, and which ones don't. Do you, do you guys remember that was about shit? Right? That like you can define green as or Right, this is a good definition of green because if something is is grew in first exam before T, it's green. The way a room is defined, and if something is green and not a grain before T, it's green. So this covers all of green things. <laughs> so this is yeah. What about like something that's like uh, I said, object that will never be on my desk. Is that numerically universal or is that strictly universal? Because if uh, if you could theoretically control what will be on your desk, then you could say without a doubt what will never be on your desk, right? Couldn't you? Or is that I'm not sure if it matters? Does it matter what I can control, or is it just that you know? It's just not specific enough to be considered yeah. strictly universal, or well, it's I mean. So it can't. So something that that never has been and never will be on my desk is obviously can't exist in any spatio-temporal location. That is, it can't exist on my desk. <laughs> uh, but since you're just subtracting a finite piece out of infinite space and time, it might seem like that doesn't really interfere with the testability. Um, in principle. Although, of course, if the spatiotemporal region were much bigger than my desk, you know, it might really interfere with the testability in practice. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this I, this example is actually similar in that, like, the, you know, the, the, the two spatiotemporal regions that are involved are both infinite, right? It's like, and before T and after T. I, I don't know. I mean, but I, I mean, I think so. Like Popper might want to offer a technical answer to that question, but I think whatever the technical answer would be, it would be motivated by what I was just the right issues I was just raising. How does this affect? The question of whether this is an objective statement that anyone can test. Yeah. So, like, in, so, so in the case of well, in the case of blue, at least we want to we want to say green is not like that. And blue is. In the case of blue, you know, you can't test whether things are blue. Um, well, see, actually, it's a little bit complicated. You can always tell whether something is blue. If you know when it was first examined. I also, you know, I, I should I should try to find this someday. I'm sure Popper says something about blue somewhere. In his writings, but I just don't know what he says about it. So I mean, so yeah, so so maybe this is kind of a weird example. Right, like the thesis, all emeralds are blue, is you know, like as testable as the thesis, all emeralds are blue. But in any case, um, 
the reason I wrote this up here is just to so the Goodman will say, you know, you can't tell just by the fact that this mentions Paris, because you could, you know, define your predicates in such a weird way that it turns out that, you know, electron by itself means something that has to be found in Paris, whereas in having in Paris it's something that can be anywhere. Right. So like um, so I mean Popper agrees with that basically. Right? So he says, like, this is on page 47. The instruments of symbolic logic are no more adequate for handling the problem of universals than for handling the problem of induction. By, by which, uh, you know, I'm not understanding the system right. But I think he means, at least in part, yeah, you can't tell by the logical form of a predicate whether it's really universal or not. Um, maybe this is, I guess, uh, clearer what he says on page 42. The question whether the laws of science are strictly or numerically universal cannot be settled by argument. It is one of those questions which can be settled only by an agreement or a convention. Right? So, like, basically, he's saying that, you know, whether a predicate, and therefore whether the um, statement that contains that predicate is strictly universal or not is a matter of our intention. Yeah, that sounds like entrenchment, kind of from what Goodman was talking about, in the sense that it has to be um, like what has which predicates have been proven in the past reliably. That kind of sounded the same. Or so well, uh, no, I mean, so it, it, entrenchment is. Um, Like the fact that a certain predicate is entrenched is something that kind of happens to me. Right? Like, uh, you know, whether I like it or not, this predicate is entrenched. Isn't that kind of what convention? I don't know. No, so convention is, is, is supposed to mean that this predicate is strictly universal when I use it because I agree. <laughs> With the other parties for the convention that we're going to use it as strictly universal. So it's like supposed to be active as opposed to passive. Um, okay, so anyway, so I mean, this is really just setting up the issue about universal terms. So, like, you know, like one of the differences between a term that's strictly universal or that's used as strictly universal. And a term that's just numerically universal or is being used as just numerically universal is that these terms can in principle be defined by pointing to things, um, pointing to individuals. Um, but these terms certainly can't. I mean, you can't point to enough things. <laughs> um, to uh, make it clear which things are everywhere and always are in the extension of this concept and which are not. I, you know, I mean, maybe it's actually a little more complicated than that. I, I, you could imagine that there are actually ways of thinking about how reference works or whatever, that maybe, yeah, you can succeed. If electron is like a natural type and they're all exactly like each other, but even pointing to just one of them, they somehow could do it. But anyway, what, what Popper says, and it's not unreasonable, is that you can't define a strictly universal term by extension, by pointing to things. Um, uh, right, so he says on page 50, um, it should have been clear that only individual names or concepts can be fixed by ostensibly referring to quote, real objects. 
say by pointing to a certain thing and uttering a name, or by attaching to it a label bearing a name, etc. Yet the concepts which are to be used in the axiomatic system should be universal names, which cannot be defined by empirical indications, pointing, etc. So the conclusion is that that axiomatic system um, um, that the, the terms used, the universal terms used in the axiomatic system um, can be defined. This is also on page 54. Oh, here we go. They can be defined, if at all, only explicitly with the help of other universal names. Otherwise, they can only be left undefined. So, um, so and that means that some of the universal names are going to have to be left undefined. Right? Because they can only be defined in terms of other universal names, but obviously you can't all define them all in terms of each other. <laughs> um, I mean, Putnam kind of takes exception to that and says, well, but there are circles in every dictionary. But I mean, but like, at least the way Popper is thinking of what definition would have to do, yeah, it won't work if it's circular. It won't help, right? Like, you know, if I tell you um, this lots example, a fiber is a thing that is made of other fibers. <laughs> fiber is a thing that is made of fibers or something like that. <laughs> so, I mean, there yeah, the circle is, is obviously really small. That doesn't tell you anything if you don't already know what fiber is. Right. So, I mean, so this, so some of the universal terms will have to be left undefined. And the question is, which ones will have to be left undefined? I mean, so like the picture I was drawing before, I think, and last time when I suddenly stopped and said, no, I just said something wrong. I mean, it's not so much that I said something wrong is that, well, I mean, so here's how I think it's supposed to work. So here we have the action. And so this part, like Popper agrees with, like the axioms are the most universal statements. By which, as I said, proper means they're like the farthest from the from the basic statements, from the observation statements. Um, and all the other ones are all the other universal statements can be like deduced from them somehow. And at the bottom, we get the ones that are closest to the observation statements. So, um, so deduction goes this way. And then what I was saying at the end last time is, well, but the like instructional system or the like uh, definition will have to go the other way. So that's I, that's not right according to Popper, but that's that that's what seems like it would have to be true if you're the kind of empiricist he's arguing against. Right. Well, they, so they, you know, they say, well, look, you know, how do we know what any of these things mean? Well, it's ultimately only by being shown concrete examples of them. Right. How else can we learn? Klein says something almost word for word like this. Like, right. How else can we learn what the word means except by being shown an example of it? So, you know, so. Um, so like what someone like this will say is that these terms at the bottom are so to speak undefined, that is they're not defined in terms of other universal terms, they're defined empirically by pointing at them. And then, um, so, so they're, um, they don't get their meaning by being defined, but they get their meaning somehow just from sense data. This is supposed to be exactly parallel to what the same people think about um, 
how the lowest level statements get justified just by sense data. So in both cases, probably things are wrong, right? So, but the idea would be, yeah, that these things get their meaning not by a definition, but by pointing. And then definition will go this way. So meaning will be transmitted this way back up to the term, the, the terms that are used in the axioms. Right? So, like in other words, you know, you can imagine this as a story as a story about someone growing up. So this, right, like first you're told, you know, this is a book, and this is a table. And then like later on, it's explained what an atom is and stuff like that, using the words you already know, like book and table. But book and table were never defined in terms of something else. And you just learned it by someone saying this is a book. Right. So the proper um, so the, so Popper's point that strictly universal terms can't be empirically defined means that that won't work according to them. So another alternative is then to say that the most universal terms, that is the ones that are used in the axioms, are going to be the ones that are left undefined, but they're implicitly defined by the axioms. And that's the conventionalist proposal that Popper is also against, right? So the empiricist proposal we just said won't work. We can't get meaning into our universal terms just by pointing to things. The conventionalist proposal, he says, will work, but it's a bad idea. <laughs> um, so, I mean, um, I'm going to say more about that in a moment because there's a lot more about conventionalism in the reading for today. So, um, but just like um, roughly speaking, the reason according to Popper it's a bad idea is because it makes the axioms unfalsifiable, right? Because implicit definition of the terms of the axioms works by saying, you know, like, what do we mean by? A line, a point, let's say these were axes, your geometrical axioms. What do we mean by a line, a point, a plane, the relation of line between stuff like that? Well, we mean whatever makes these axioms come out true. And then, you know, sure enough, we can be sure that the axioms and everything else that you get from them is true. <laughs> um, but it says nothing at all about the world because it can't be falsified. So it doesn't forbid any particular state of things. Um, so um, now, I mean, I guess it's worth stop, stopping to think at this point. So in the, the, the latest paper we read by Carnap, the methodological character paper, he actually adopted exactly this for the, for the theoretical language. He said, you know, we're going to introduce primitive undefined terms into axioms. And uh, um, What? Well, because of the translation rules to the observation language, back and forth, given some things we observe and this theory, we can deduce other things. Well, but I guess, I mean, this can go wrong, 
Yeah, so maybe I shouldn't say that. Carnap isn't exactly adopting this because he's not saying that these are implicitly, these are, must be true because they're the definition of the terms. Because after all, it can go wrong, you can predict something and find that does not happen. Yeah. So if the axioms are uh, unfalsifiable, yeah. uh, that would permit. Any deduction, I guess, if they, if they can be anything, um, because you can't prove them untrue. So I don't know why. Why do we <clears throat> consider them axioms if they're like not necessarily based on uh, like true happenings? Well, so I mean, <laughs> like according to the convention list, these are conventions of our language that you know we're going to use these words this way but um, so we shouldn't expect them to be true or false they're like definitions so they can change them so that but they're unfalsifiable i don't no, well, definitions are not falsifiable. You know, I'm going to talk about this more because I said I'm going to talk about conventionalism at greater length in a second. So let, maybe, maybe when I come back to that, because right now I just, I just want to say that you know, so another alternative is to make these the undefined terms and if you define them implicitly. The proper also doesn't like that. So. Um, so which terms terms does proper think should be undefined? And I think the answer is he doesn't really care which terms are in. <laughs> I mean, some somewhere in your theory there have to be undefined universal terms. That he's saying is just a logical fact you can't get away from that. But which they are doesn't matter that much. What matters is that you don't think of the theory as implicitly defining. <laughs> So, um, right, so he says, this difficulty, I believe, can only be overcome by means of a methodological decision. I shall accordingly adopt a rule not to use undefined concepts as if they were implicitly defined. So we can't define all the terms in the theory, but we show, we show that we mean something by them by our attempts to falsify the theory. Right? Like, as you know, since we're um, the way we're using them involves an intention, intention to give up the theory in the face of certain empirical evidence. Um, uh, we clearly were using them to mean something that wasn't just implicitly defined by the theory. Now, I mean, well, I'm also going to come back to talk about that. In fact, this is the next thing I'm going to talk about, so maybe I shouldn't even say I'm going to come back to talk about it. But, I mean, but, you know, you might ask, you might imagine why asking, uh, you show that you understand them that way by what you do. How can I tell? <laughs> right? Is this really empirically decidable? So, I mean, I, I think Popper has maybe has an answer to that, but I'll come back, back to that after I say more about conventionalism. So, um, yeah, so let, like, I feel like I've already said a lot of things about conventionalism because it's like questions and the way things, but I still, I, I want to talk about it more seriously as all one thing. I mean, it's a like pretty important view in the, in the, in the history of philosophy of science, even though none of the people we're reading are really conventionalists, but, you, but like it's, it's definitely, um, You know, it's an attractive view in this period 
uh, and it's something that those who are not attracted to it feel like they really have to fight against by cause of it. So, so what is conventionalism exactly? So, like, I mean, first of all, I guess almost everyone agrees that language is partly conventional. Or maybe I should even say that language is mostly conventional. So, like, if you take the English word cat, um, like, why does this mean what it does? Well, it's just because we kind of agree to use it to mean that. Now, obviously, it's not an explicit agreement. There isn't literally a convention we all sign on to, right? But, you know, um, if uh, people who speak English stopped all using the word to mean the same thing, then it, it wouldn't mean that anymore. Right? It's, it's, it's just because we all agree that it means that, that it has that meaning. Um, so, uh, So if I say something like, you know, that's a three years. Part of what makes this true is a convention. Um, Or I guess I should say at least part of what makes it true is a convention, right? It's at least partly true by by virtue of a convention. So, um, so, but, right? I mean, that is that's again that 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 should be kind of. Odd. I mean, there are various things you can say against this, but let's. <laughs> but I'm going to ignore them. It should be kind of obvious. In the sense that, but like, if cat didn't mean what it means, this might not be true, right? So, like, if the word cat, if we use the word cat to refer to the animals we now call cows, then since cows don't have coin ears, this sentence would be false. Yeah? I guess I'm just wondering, like, when we say it's conventional, are you talking about just the language, just the words, or also the concepts that the words are referring to as well? Like the concept of a cat is not the same as the word of a cat, but is that also a convention? Like the fact that we categorize things that are like four legged, furry, just like that size and whatever as the same thing? Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. That's. <laughs> um, that's like a really complicated question. Unlike what I was just saying, the answer to that is not obvious. It's, 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 like it shouldn't appear obvious, right? It's, you know, I mean, you might think that we class those things together because they're really similar to each other. Or, you know, because it's really useful, to, you know. But on the other hand, yeah, there are people like, you know, Locke says that uh, a sort of things is even he, I guess, makes it makes some exceptions to this problem, but like he might not say this about the body, right? But like a sort of things generally means the things that we use the same word to, that's, you know. So, but in any case, you know, so here, here I'm talking about a spoken or written sentence. And I'm just saying that if it's true, it's true partly, partly at least by convention. It wouldn't be true if our conventions, the conventions of our language were different. So, so, but after that, we face uh, like a decision about how to understand. It. So one way, I guess, would be like the empiricist way. The empiricist way of understanding it is that it's it's true. And like by the way, when I say this is true, I mean so this doesn't exactly mean like for all x 
implies point to here to x. Um, like if it did exactly mean that it would be false because some cats like you know have their ears cut off or whatever, right? So like you know, um, it it means something probably a lot more complicated. Like cats naturally have pointy ears or something like that, right? But um, but actually, I don't think that matters for these purposes, right? So it's just like, so the, the question here is, the empiricist will say, this is true, partly because of the convention that establishes the meaning of the words, but also partly because of what things are actually like. So, you know, uh, if cats meant something different, then this might be false. But also, if cats' ears were different, it would be false. Um, whereas the conventionalist way, would be to see this as a partial definition of the word cat. So when I say cats have pointy ears, um, um, I'm telling you part of the convention, basically. Right? Like if you imagine that you don't know English and I'm teaching you English, so I'm like trying to kind of induct you into our convention. You know, here I'm telling you part of it. You don't know what cat means, but let's, we have this, we already know what has pointy ears means somehow, right? So, I mean, that's part of how Klein is going like, to cast out on this whole way of thinking about things. But anyway, like assuming you already know what have pointy ears means, um, I'm going to like help you understand how we use the word cat by saying, among other things, cats have pointy ears. So, like, if you understand it that way, then it's true totally by convention. It doesn't matter what the world is like. It has to be true. Because this is our agreement. We're only going to call things cats if they have pointy ears. So, like, again, you know, that doesn't... Maybe I should use a more, maybe I shouldn't use a sample that brings up this complication. But I like this example because it has cats in it. And I like cats. So anyway, like so um, uh, again, it's it's complicated what we're saying the convention is here. But we're saying something like that, you know, the word cat is used to, so like we do have to assume that there are natural kinds of things or something, right? The word cat is used to a kind of thing that naturally has pointy ears. That's part of its definition. So, like, if um, we, you know, go somewhere else and find a whole bunch of animals that are otherwise like cats, but they're all born with round ears, um, we're going to say they're not cats, right? Because according to our convention, we don't call things cats unless they belong to a kind that naturally has pointy ears. Yeah. It seems like conventionalists would have a lot of problems with dealing with specific situations that don't like neatly fit the definitions of the universal terms. Uh, it, it seems like if my if just my cat happens to not have pointy ears, then that's not a cat. I don't know, it just seems very like, dubious. Well, like I said, so that's why maybe I should have used a much simpler example. I mean, so like here's you no, know, this example raises other problems, but let me think of, try to think of something. I'm sure I can't think of an example that doesn't raise any problems. <laughs> um, well, I mean, so here's an example that Popper uses. 
Lead has a melting point. Which you have to add at standard pressure, whatever. Um, I don't know what it is, but anyway, 10 degrees, right? So we're going to some number of it, but I don't know. <laughs> right. So, you know, like here you can see it's, it's not so complicated, right? Like if I have a, if I have a piece of metal in my room and I raise it to that temperature under standard conditions and it doesn't melt, then the conventionalist, it's quite clear. I was supposed to say it's not lead. Right? I just determined it's not lead because like this is part of the definition of lead. Whereas, you know, uh, someone else who's a, who takes this statement empirically is is gonna it means that they at least can, you know, there could be a situation where you would have something that's lead and it doesn't melt, and now you've discovered that this is false, right? That this is not always true. So, like I said, the cat's example, even though I like the cat's example better, raises problems because this kind of natural historical statement is not really equivalent to a universal quantification. It's something much more complicated. So, right? You say, you know, cats are quadrupeds, and you know, hunt mice and whatever. There are some cats that only have three legs, and some cats that don't hunt mice. We used to have a cat that bit a cat and had pet rats at the same time, and the cat never, like, even looked at the rats. <laughs> she was just not a hunter, she wasn't interested. <laughs> but she was still a cat. Yeah, I can still see problems with this though, because like there are like what about like different isotopes of lead? Like lead is not as specific as like you think it is. I feel like, uh, or at least some people think it is, and that could you know apply to a lot of things. Well, I mean, you to... know, so 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 like where the empiricists would see, say we've discovered that there are different isotopes of lead and that they don't all have the same melting point. And then what we called lead, you know, before was a mixture of these different isotopes and et cetera, et cetera. The conventionalist will say, you know, so like if there's one isotope that actually has this melting point, let's say we've discovered that that's lead and it was mixed with impurities. If like no pure isotope has that melting point, they've escaped. They'll say we discovered there is no lead, <laughs> right? I mean, it's consistent, as Proper says. Right? That is, or actually, he's a little more cautious than that. He says like this view could only be disproved by showing that it's inconsistent, which is not likely to succeed. <laughs> Right, they, they always have something to say. It's, um, but, um, but what I wanted to, to, to go into a little bit, which Popper really doesn't, is like why, so in the case of cats on 20 years, this doesn't seem very attractive. You know, I mean, Uh, we don't really, not, even in that case, we have a really good alternative necessarily in mind, right? Like if you said, I mean, it's not like we know what the real definition of cat is, <laughs> and this isn't part of it. Um, so, like, I mean, again, that's part of how Klein, um, I think it's, Klein doesn't disagree that this is partly true because of, you might not agree to call it conventions, but it's partly true because of, yeah, contingent agreements among human beings. Um, and it's partly true because of the way the world is, but he's, he, would, he would point out that we don't know where to draw the line exactly. Right, so that we can't give examples of statements that are definitely true only by convention, that is analytic statements, and others that are definitely true partly not by convention, that is synthetic statements. But so, I mean, anyway, 
as I was starting to say, even though we don't have a really necessarily have a really great uh, counter proposal, I think in the case of the past like 20 years, it's like we're not very inclined to say that that's just conventional, that's part of the definition of cap or something like that. Uh, we think this tells us something interesting, about, somewhat interesting about cats. Um, not very interesting. But, uh, so, um, but when it comes to geometry and like fundamental physical laws, there are, there are reasons that make it sometimes can make it seem like conventionalism is the only option. So, um, So like the axioms of Euclidean geometry, either, so, I mean, I guess there's two, really more than two different things you could mean by the axioms of Euclidean geometry. One would be things that actually Euclid didn't really call an axiom, but they that. But, but in most, treatment, most uh, treatments of Euclid are called axioms. Um, and then, like, uh, um, so, you know, he came up with those in the fourth century BC. <laughs> um, but then uh, the first edition, I guess, was in the very late 19th century. Del David Hilbert published a new axiomization of Euclidean geometry, which like fills in the axioms that Euclid left unstated. That's you know the way he looked at it. So, but you know, on either one of those axiomizations, the axioms contain these words like line, points, um, between, um, stuff like that. So, uh, and the question is. Uh, how do we know what those terms mean? So actually, Euclid, uh, Euclid actually defined well. Like some of these terms he didn't. Some of these terms he didn't realize maybe the importance of, or anyway, like Hilbert realized them or thought they were important in a way he didn't. But at least some of these points, uh, terms, Euclid actually has definitions. You know, like a point is something that has either length, breadth, or height, or lines, you know, it's that, like breadth is, is actually definitions of these. But I think, you know, by the time we get to when Hilbert is working, it's like most um, people have come to agree that those definitions really don't help. Um, if you don't already know what a line and a point is, those definitions are wrong. And you can see an argument about this in Hume, for example. Um, so, I mean, in any case, even if those definitions do help, there's like, a, you know, there's Popper's general point that not every term can be defined. <laughs> So, like, if you if you get rid of these terms, you're just going to have other undefined terms. So, you know, so Gilbert's approach was just to state the act to, to take these terms as primitive. Say, I'm not going to say anything about what they mean, but I'm going to state the axioms in terms of them. So from the axioms, we can prove things like the Pythagorean theorem. Right? So you can prove that if this is a right triangle, then you know the square on this side and the square on this side added together got the same area as the square on this side. That's the Pythagorean theorem. These are squares. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's the true definition, right? 
Well, that's the question. Is it true? <laughs> I mean, it's it's a consequence of the axiom. It's a pretty geometry. So um, it's also false in non-Euclidean geometry, it's right, including the real world, as we now think, which is not Euclidean. So um, it's asymptotic as Euclidean, it's the smaller depth of work. But anyway, um, so uh, so you know, you might think, um, and I guess the point is, like we have actually decided some of them, or some of us that no, this was a, a empirical plate. Um, but there's definitely problems with seeing as an empirical plate. So suppose I want to test this claim. So first of all, I mean, first of all, I have to have some lines that I know are straight. Uh, yeah. So I'm not actually going to talk about that part, um, but that's, you know, um, the problems I'm going to raise about the angle, you can also raise about the line. But, you know, but, but I have to know that this is a right angle, right? Because if I have a triangle, that's where this is not a right angle, then I don't expect the theorem to hold. So how, how can you tell that something is a right angle? Well, you know, like how, how do you empirically tell whether something is a right angle? Well, you know, I mean, you use something, it's called, in Latin, it was called a norma, where we get the word norm. <laughs> um, in English, I guess it's called a carpenter's Square or something. I've never heard anyone say that age, but I've only seen it in discussions of what normal means. But anyway, so you have, you know, you have a like a measuring device that's called a norma, and uh, you bring it up to that angle and you see if it matches. But how do you build one of these? So the way they built these was to get three sticks <laughs> that are straight. And I mean, actually, I don't know, apparently they really did a different way that you could use an approximation, but like, here's how you might think you could do it. Um, get we, one stick that's exactly three feet long, and one that's exactly four feet long, and one that's exactly five feet long, and make them into a triangle. Now you know that this is a right angle. How do you know it's a right angle? Because of the Pythagorean thing. <laughs> so you can see where the problem is going to come from, right? So to build my measuring instrument that I'm going to use to check whether the Pythagorean theorem is true or not, I have to use the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> um, and you know, like I said, you can you can tell the same story about checking whether things are straight and trying to verify that a straight path is the shortest path between two points and whatever. I have to make a ruler, and if you look into how you make a ruler and how you're sure that it's straight and it always stays the same length, you'll see that you're using the axioms of geometry to do it. So. Um, Right, so like you know, it seems like what you said. What's your name, by the way? Oh, HG. HG. It seems like what HG said to begin with is right that this is definitionally true, and the definition, of course, is not an explicit definition, but it's an implicit definition of all these terms. Like I didn't write down your angle. But, you know, it's also we'll go on the list somewhere. And angle action, maybe you can define. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, the, the way these things are all used in the axioms defines what they mean. And therefore, any consequence of the axiom must be true by definition. Yeah. This seems to kind of confirm what Popper is saying about how certain things are, certain universal terms are undefinable because, like, 
there'd be no real world way to actually like demonstrate what they mean. Um, right. I mean, that confirms it. Like this confirms that very, very well. Yeah, like I mean, so you might think you could define what it means by having uh well, like the way the meter used to be defined. So they, you know, there used to be a rod made of platinum or something for something in Paris. <laughs> like kept in a safe under controlled conditions, and that was a meter. <laughs> so that's kind of like the idea of defining things by pointing to have a meter. But uh, it has uh, has the same problem, namely that if you're far away from Paris, you can't. You don't know how long a meter is, which um, is why now the length of the meter is defined using universal terms. Right? It's like defined as a certain number of wavelengths of, uh, of the, a certain like, sodium emission line or something. <laughs> right? So, like, wherever you are in the universe, all you have to do is get some sodium. <laughs> And, you know, you can figure out how long it is. So, um, um, okay, so anyway, so, so like this is why you might think you have to be a conventionalist about the actions. And there's similar issues about the fundamental laws of nature. So like if you take, you know, take the law of inertia, which says that um, body in motion remains in motion. Unless acted on by force. Right? So this is one of the fundamental laws of Newtonian mechanics. Um, so, um, how do you how do we tell whether a force, an outside force, is acting? I mean, again, so first of all, you might, this, you know, it might seem obvious that this says something about the world and something really important, like something that Aristotelians didn't believe, for example. <laughs> right? So, and yet, when you look into it, it starts to seem like it couldn't. And so, like, so how do you tell whether an outside force is acting on a body? Well, like the only way to tell is to see whether the body is accelerating. So, um, like, if it's not, and of course, here remains in motion means doesn't accelerate. <laughs> so, um, um, and on the other hand, how can you tell if the body is accelerating? So, you know, you need to compare it to something that's not accelerating. You can see if it's motion, if its velocity is changes relative to that. Right? So, they talk about like inertial reference frames. So, you can imagine an inertial reference frame as an actual frame, <laughs> right? Like made out of wood or something. And, you know, um, and it's, it's a frame that's not accelerating. And then once you have that, you can easily tell whether some other body is accelerating by seeing whether its velocity is changing relative to this frame that's not accelerating. But how can you be sure the frame isn't accelerating? And the only way you can tell is if it's not being acted on by an outside force. <laughs> Right, so like you know, if you have a rod and a like um, bucket being swung around, 
And you want to know, is the bucket going around or is the rod going around? <laughs> so you have to compare it to something that's not being swung around. <laughs> You know, and then you can tell which one is accelerating, which one is. But how do you know it's not being swung around? Well, like it's not being acted on by, by force. <laughs> okay. So, um, I mean, so I guess like if we think, if we thought that the Earth was at rest in an inertial reference frame, which obviously it's not. Right, and it's rotating and spinning around the sun, and everything. I thought it was, and this rod was attached to the earth. I guess so. What's really going on here is the there's a net force on the bucket, so the net force on the rod is zero because this pull here is like, it's like opposed by the rod. Anyway, sorry, that's <laughs> not a detail I need to know, but so the point is like, um. Um, again, it seems like this law is true by definition. You can't find it to be false. Anytime it looks like um, you're finding it to be false, you're going to say either you know you're mistaken about what's accelerating or you're mistaken about what forces there are. So, like, if you know, if you see water remaining in the bottom of this bucket as it swings around, and you say, "Look, this water is um, accelerating towards the bottom of the bucket," now. Sorry, if you, I guess put it this way: if you if you have some water in the bucket, if you have some like balls in the bucket, you find that as the bucket swings around, they all accelerate towards the bottom of the bucket, and there's no force acting on them. You say you might say, "Oh, this is you know has been falsified," but no, it's just that like you didn't realize. Um, um, that the bucket is not an inertial reference. So what's really happening is the balls aren't accelerating towards the bottom of the bucket. The bottom of the bucket is accelerating towards the balls. Right? Because so I guess I hope we have enough physics at some point to know that moving in a circle is, is accelerating towards the center of the circle. So as the bucket goes around, the bottom of the bucket is always accelerated towards the pole, right? So, you know, um, right, so, and that's, that's the way, like, actually, you always have two options whenever you find what looks like a violation of this law. Either you were wrong about what was the commercial reference for it, or you were wrong about what forces there were. But it, anyway, you do it, the law can't be falsified. Um, so, like the historical context of this, and this is why I think people become so interested in it at this moment, is that I mean, partly because of mathematical developments in the 19th century, right? So, in the later 19th century, people um, started to develop non Euclidean systems of geometry and even proved that they were. Actually, what was the proof that they were consistent? It might have been a little bit later. But anyway, they proved, you know, you can you can prove that uh, certain non-Euclidean systems of geometry are consistent if Euclidean geometry is consistent. So um, so uh, but at the same time, some like some people were starting to think, oh, and maybe that could be the real geometry. So I think that kind of started people thinking in this direction, but of course, what gave the big push towards it a little bit later was Einstein's claim to have discovered like 
first, the special relativity shows that the laws of Newtonian mechanics are not true. And then general relativity shows that space is not Euclidean. In a way, special relativity already shows that space is not true. It shows that space time in terms of space. But anyway, whatever. So, um, so, uh, so, like, uh, the conventionalist response to that would be, uh, you may think that you've proved that Einstein, but it's impossible by definition. Right, so like that picture I drew before of the twin quasar, where like there's really just one quasar, but there's two shortest paths from us to the quasar. To geodesics, as they say. And you know, one of them comes from this direction and is this long, and the other comes from this direction and is a different way. Um, they would just say, this is impossible, these aren't really lines. Um, of course, I can't draw them on this board for that. I could draw this on the sphere. Um, right, so um, so I think, I mean, that's the context for Popper's discussion of conventionalism, especially in chapter four. So in chapter three, he discusses conventionalism, as I mentioned before, mostly as a view about like how to implicitly define the terms in the theory. But in chapter four, he discusses conventionalism as a set of quote unquote stratagems to avoid falsification. And he says, you know, these stratagems will be used to defend the classical theory of the day. Um, so, like, he's stating this as a kind of general principle, like, this is what always happens when theories get overthrown, conventionalists arise to, like, defend the classical theory of the day in these terms. I'm not sure there are any other good examples of that other than Einstein and special general relativity, um, but, um, but anyway, that's the big example on his mind. That's why he's so worried about this. And um, he actually, he says, I don't think it's in this book, but he's, let me see this. He says somewhere that, you know, like his uh, whole philosophical outlook was partly formed by how impressed he was with um, Einstein submitting the theory of general relativity to test. Right, like, you know, like with the, the famous uh, experiment where they saw how starlight was deflected by coming close to the sun. And it matched the predictions of the theory. If it had matched, the theory would have been wrong. People are staring at like an but anyway. <laughs> right, because, you know, because the sun is a mass, it bends space and time. Not very much, but, like, you know, so, like, they waited to till an eclipse and they saw how certain stars under the sun seemed to change their position where they double would be. And you verify that the amount is exactly what Einstein theory. Now, now there's actually much more sensitive tests. The uh, the binary pulsar is giving off gravitational waves. You can tell. Anyway, so um, So, like from Popper's point of view, that you know, um, Einstein is like a paradigm. I shouldn't use that word, but I don't decrude. But <laughs> Einstein is like a, you know, the the main example he has in mind. You know, successful advance in science. Um, so I think that's why he sees conventionalism as a particularly serious threat. 
Um, I mean, I think you could put it a little differently too and say that his Popper's criterion of, of demarcation was specifically designed to make sure that Einstein and Newton would count as empirical science. <laughs> um, and because remember, when you get outside of empir empirical science, he's not worried about this, right? Like he is a conventionalist about um, his criterion of demarcation, for example. Right, so he says, you know, when we call, uh, we say these things are empirical science and these things are not. Um, sorry, like when we say empirical sciences have falsifiable theories, that's true by definition, if you accept my proposal. Um, which, I mean, It doesn't, it doesn't mean that he wouldn't give up his proposal no matter what. But it does mean that he's not going to give it up for like empirical reasons. And therefore, I think means that he's not going to, well. If he's so to speak rationally forced to give it up, it won't be for theoretical reasons. What reasons would there be? Well, so actually, um, Popper says, um, we're not going to read this, but it's part of his response, I think, to the paper we're going to read by Lakatosh um, next week. And, you know, he says, like, people have often asked me, okay, Popper, what would you do to give up your theory? You know, and he says, like, first of all, it's a misunderstanding if that's supposed to show an inconsistency, because I never said that my theory was falsifiable in the way a scientific theory is. On the contrary, he always denied, right? Like he always said, I'm not a naturalist, methodology is not part of empirical science, etc. But he says, but actually, I do have an answer for you. <laughs> what would give, get me to give up my theory? If it turned out that my criterion couldn't make any distinction between Newton and Einstein on the one hand, and Freud and like 20th century Marxism on the other hand, I would give up my proposal. Meaning he would give it up if it turned out not to be useful for what he wanted. Right? <laughs> that's, um, that's why you give up a practical proposal. Um, I mean, in effect, right now, this, um, I guess this is, well, this isn't, I was pointing out, it's not like, it's not like Carnap's developed view is really conventionalist exactly, although it's, it's got a lot of conventionalism in it. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think, you know, early on he wrote a paper, or he wrote, actually it's his doctoral dissertation about space. And, you know, part of what he says there in answer to conventionalism is that, like, it's true what mathematical system we use to describe space is a matter of convention. But the way we should decide which convention to adopt is which is more convenient to our ends. So that would be like, like if you go back to that geometrical example, you know, like if I find that in order to make Euclidean geometry, um, true, I have to assume that all our measuring instruments are constantly changing their size and shape in some complicated way. I can go on saying that, but it's not very convenient. 
would be easier to say if I find some other set of implicit definitions according to which our measurement instruments are not doing that, it would be easier to switch to that new convention, right? So, in other words, it seems like um, what Popper is saying about his own view, like it could be turned around into a defense of something like conventionalism, saying, no, it's true, the theory can't be plausible, but it can still be overturned. Um, if it turns out that, that those aren't good definitions. Um, right, but anyway, sorry, that's kind of a digression. Um, are there questions? Because I'm going to start trying to talk about what Popper's alternative to this would be. Um, Are there, are there questions about any of the stuff I said about conventionalism so far? Okay. So, so Popper's alternative to conventionalism, I mean, in a way I already said this, but it's like, so, right. So we can't define line or force or acceleration. Or, I mean, if we can define those, we'll, we'll reach the end somewhere, right? We're going to end up with some undefined terms. And um, um, but Popper's understanding is although we can't define them, we did mean something. And uh, and it's not fair. It's against the rules of the game to change what we mean by them later to save our. Now, I mean, so you might say, well, okay, but if there's no definition, how can we tell? what we meant by one of these terms. Um, therefore, how can we tell if we've changed it? <laughs> right? Like, you know, um, it's supposed to be a rule against changing what it means. But, it's, but in order to do that, it seems like we must be able to say what it meant before and check whether it means something new now. Um, So as I understand it, and like he does not say this in so many words, so I'm reading something into him here, but as I understand it, um, Popper thinks, well, so if this question means um, what can force us to take the axioms to be the problem rather than something else? Right? In other words, what we find using our own measuring instruments that, um, like laser beams or <laughs> whatever, but the Pythagorean theorem is not true for some triangle. So, um, uh, what can force us to say it's the axioms that are wrong, not our measuring instruments? And the answer is, um, Nothing forces us. <laughs> I mean, so obviously nothing physically forces us to do that, but also nothing logically forces us to do that. We can consistently be conventionalists. So we can consistently always keep saying that our theory is true. Um, So the only thing that would force us would be like our own intention. And now, like if you ask, how can we be sure of 
what our intention was. Um, I think that, you know, in Kantian terms, that's like the question, how can I tell what, the, what is the supreme maxim of my will? How can I tell whether, um, and I mean, so that's that's a that, right, that's a phrase from Kant's ethics, and the answer according to Kant is you can't, <laughs> you can't know. So right, like that comes up in this general context of like if I do something that's um, um, that would be morally good, how can I tell if I did it because it's morally good or if I had like some secret side ulterior motives. And Kant says, you can't tell. <laughs> um, you don't know if your will is pure. So, so this is like at a minimum, I think for Popper is like an analogous question. How can I tell if I'm following the rules of the methodological game or not? Right? So like how, you know, how can I tell if um, I'm saying, reacting to this new data the way I am because I had a pure intention to use my terms in a certain empirical way and I'm continuing with that, or whether I'm just like adopting a strategy to get out of it. And I think, again, the answer is like, you can't tell. I, and I, I think this would be his answer to Quine as well. <laughs> like, you, can, you know, like the law isn't given to us so that we can um, feel good about ourselves because we, we, we can tell that we're keeping it. <laughs> the law is given us to keep it, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, it's, there's no purpose to being able to tell. <laughs> the purpose is to doing it. Right, so um, I mean, uh, and I, I think you know, for so like you know that got kind of deep, kind of quickly, but um, but you know, but I think it's the, it's the right depth, right? Like Popper is. Um, so I said this was at a minimum analogous, but actually somehow it's. He doesn't spell it out in this book, at least, but it's clear that for Popper, there is some ethical slash political issue here involved in, in scientific methodology. I mean, you just think about his two examples of pseudosciences, and you can see how that must be true, right? They're, they're, it's like his, his favorite examples of pseudoscience are not astrology and something like that. Right, like not some silly thing that someone might believe. It's, it's examples are Freudian psychoanalysis and certain kind of Marxism, right? So like, it's clear that he's, I mean, why would you be especially worried about those theories? You'd be worried about presumably because of their ethical or political implications. So, right, so, so I think like Popper thinks it's, somehow literally an ethical slash political issue, whether we use our terms in such a way that we can falsify or not. Um, okay, but anyway, so partly for that reason, um, the, um, The methodological, like Popper's response to conventionalism is, I mean, at some part, at some places he goes into a certain amount of detail, but basically the overall response is just don't do that. <laughs> right? So like in other words, he, he talks about four different kinds of stratagems or actually uh, in Germany he calls them twists. <laughs> conventionalist twists, like to get out of things. And he lists four general ones. So one would be ad hoc hypotheses. Another is 
modification of definitions, another is rejection of observations, and another is referral to future theoretical advances. So, right, so like sometimes if an observation seems to violate the theory, you can say, well, we just don't understand the consequences of theory well enough, but in the future it will be shown how this, it, might, it will have to be shown how this observation doesn't contradict it. Now, I mean, these are things that like, so a conventional, strictly speaking, doesn't, well, no, I guess, yeah, these all, these, these all are things that a conventionalist can say when faced with an apparent violation of the axioms. There are also things that you can do to try to hold on to a theory, even if you're not a conventionalist, but you're just trying to hold on to the theory, right? So it's kind of a more general threat. But, um, um, like I said, it's, you know, there isn't that much uh, detail ex except just that you shouldn't do it. Um, but the one detail there is, and I guess this is kind of, a, it kind of applies overall to his response to all of these things is, you shouldn't do it unless, so you shouldn't do it because, um, and this is important, Carnap, Carnap, Popper is not going to say, and it would be uh, really strange for him to say, you should never fix your theory to, I mean, you should never fix things up between your theory and your observations. Um, like, you know, suppose you, um, you have a theory of celestial mechanics and you find um, that according to, right, so like Newtonian celestial mechanics predicts if there's only two bodies in the universe and they're both point masses, which we also have to add that, that um, they'll both travel on paths around the center of mass that are conic sections forever. So like like meaning an ellipse or a circle if it's closed, right? So in the center of mass, if one is much more massive, the center of mass can basically be right next to this part. So we can just think of this sort of going around it. But of course there aren't only two bodies in the universe, right? There's like other bodies. So like in our solar system, this is the sun, there's also Jupiter, which is like not nearly as big as the sun, but it's pretty big. <laughs> so it makes a difference. So it means that all the other planets don't exactly go in elliptical orbits around the center of mass of the solar system. They, you know, they're perturbed by Jupiter. So suppose you do the calculation, not only for Jupiter, but for all the planets, and you work out what the orbit should be. And then you find that the outermost planet that you know about, which was Uranus at the time, um, is not orbiting the way your theory predicts. You figured in all the perturbations, you predicted where Uranus will be next, and it's not there. <laughs> so you're a little bit off. So what do you do? Do you say Newtonian mechanics is falsified to buy Newtonian mechanics? Well, that's not what people actually did. What they actually did was um, they figured out that there's a particular way to add another planet, right? And you know they figured out what the order of that other planet would have to be, and where it would have to be in its orbit, and what its mass would have to be. And they say, if there's a planet like that, we can explain these perturbations. So, you know, they told the Berlin Observatory, point your telescope in this direction on a certain night, and they point it there, and there's Neptune. <laughs> so that was the right thing to do, right? <laughs> 
So, you know, so Papa can't say never do stuff like this. Um, and that, that example is going to come up again in Putnam. Um, so, uh, and I guess Lakatosh also raises it, and remember. But so, um, so, uh, but roughly speaking, Popper's answer is, well, you can do this, but you should only do it when it makes your theory stronger, that is more falsifiable. So you should think of it as if you're proposing a new theory. And you ask, like, would that theory be attractive on its own merits? And so if you find that it's like a stronger theory than your old theory, then I'm not sure you have to do this, but at least you can do it. It doesn't violate the rules to do it. Give it a try, right? Whereas if you find that the old theory, the, the, the new proposed theory is weaker than the old theory, then he says that's how you can tell that you're just doing conventional strategies. Now, like how adequate this is as an answer, not so clear. I mean, for one thing, saying that there is a planet Neptune on a certain orbit is not, that's, that really can't be added into your theory. It's not a strict universal. Um, but anyway, something like that is his approach. Okay. Um, ooh, I'm almost out of time. I wanted to say more about falsifiability, which is actually what this whole chapter is about. <laughs> but I guess uh, I'll have to talk about that next time. But I mean, but just as an introduction to that. So um, once all the methodological issues are settled, then Popper says, right? So once you agree not to do any of these strategies, then we can look at your theory and see like, is it logically falsified? Does it, you know, does it forbid certain basic statements? So all the discussion, and there is a lot of discussion about this, um, all the discussion about that is all based on the assumption that we first taken the decision not to be conventionalists, um, or not to otherwise try to defend our theories against falsification. Okay, uh, I'll see you Thursday.